Hello there to everyone. And I'm so, so happy and thankful for uh, being asked to be here today at the amazing uh, Zero Project Chile, Latin America. Um, and uh, I'm very, very happy and uh, I'm looking forward to hear all the amazing presentations in this sessions and in the entire um, uh, program. Uh, today, the session that I'm going to, uh, to lead here is going to be about uh, open path, internships and apprenticeships, um, um, taking basically organizations and um, uh, companies that work closely with people with disabilities, and we will all share our experience firsthand from offering or implementing internship or work experience programs for people with disabilities in various areas as a gateway to the world of work. Now, I think we can all say whether we are um, uh, in our country or looking abroad, I think this whole uh, pandemic that has hit uh, um, globally has really put the focus on employment. Um, uh, in many countries, we are uh, told that people with disabilities are probably the first ones or among the first to be uh, released and dismissed. Uh, and it's very difficult for them to find work. But on the good side of the, uh, um, uh, this, this equation is that many people with disabilities that for many years did not think they are part of the workplace, all of a sudden understand that now that remote employment is possible, they can be in the game also. So I think that this session will give important input and insight on how we can encourage, how we can make inclusive employment work in general and definitely post COVID-19. So I'm very, very happy and I'm, uh, I will be very proud to introduce later on uh, our other presenters, but I will start with my experience uh, to talk from, from uh, the experience of a CEO of an organization operating from Israel. Um, and I call this uh, presentation, the richness and happiness of inclusive employment. Now, the reason I chose this weird um, uh, name for our presentation is because in Hebrew, the word richness and the word happiness sound the same, oshir. The only difference is one letter. And the beauty is in inclusive employment, when you do it right, as a CEO, I'm telling you, you also gain happiness and a better place of work and also a more profitable one. And this is something that I hope I'll be able to share with you today. I always introduce myself as Michal Rimon, the proud CEO of Access Israel. I'm proud of uh, our accomplishments, about our products, our projects, but most of all, proud of my employees, my partners, my volunteers, the human factor that is Access Israel and makes everything uh, possible. A little word about us. Access Israel was established 21 years ago, and our goal is to promote accessibility and improve the quality of life for people with all types of disability uh, uh, in all areas of life, and to do so in a way that is with dignity, with respect, as equals, and with a high level of independence. Again, accessibility is not a goal, it's the name. The goal is inclusion, true inclusion, and this is very true on the subject we are talking about today. Now, just a little uh, uh, data, Access Israel uh, has more than 100 employees. More than 50% of our employees are people with disabilities. All types of disabilities are represented among the Access Israel staff, whether it's physical, um, blindness, uh, um, uh, hearing uh, disabilities, uh, cognitive, mental, um, uh, speech, really the whole nine yards. And many of our projects are based on inclusion. So beyond the employees, we also bring together people with and without disabilities. Many times we are not really familiar or necessarily familiar with them, and we need to be prepared for whatever comes. Now, the challenges and tips for successful uh, um, inclusive employment is first of all, awareness. I think that the amazing uh, session uh, and uh, the fact that this conference is choosing uh, to focus on this session uh, of, and, and the subject of employment is part, an important part of awareness. To understand, to see what others are doing, 
to learn from challenges, to learn from mistakes, to learn from successes, to be aware of what are we talking about? Many times we say the word disability. Do we really understand who is included there? Do we really understand what the needs are? Raising awareness is a very, very important key for success of this process. Another thing that I can tell you that we have a big, big challenge with is when you come to recruit a person with disability, whether it's for internship or for employment, many times the reaction I get is, you want me? A lot of people with disabilities are not really sure that they are work material, that they are worthy, that they, are, they can do it. And a lot of the awareness is not only on the side of the employer, but also on the side of people with disability themselves. Yes, we want you. Yes, you can. With the right setting, with the right accessibility, with the right preparedness, you can also join a workforce. And I can tell you that especially after COVID-19, we see it even more. Now that more and more workplaces have understood that remote working, remote employment is possible, people who couldn't leave their house in the past can definitely join the workforce. So yes, we want you. Another thing with accessibility is balancing between the needs of various disabilities. Uh, an important thing I can share with you is that, you know, accessibility is all about balance. Uh, a blind person would be very happy if in the workplace, from the moment he enters the building till his desk and kitchen and whatever, there's a great tactile uh, um, uh, strip that basically when you walk on the tactiles, you feel in your feet the bumps and you know that that road is clear, it's accessible, and you can go, and it's a great accessibility tool for a blind person. But what happens when his co-worker with crutches or with a walker or with a wheelchair has to go to the same toilets or the same uh, kitchen using those tactiles? All of a sudden, something that is a great accessibility asset for a blind person can be an obstacle for one with uh, a different disability. Eliminating paternalistic approaches. You know, many employers um, uh, have the feeling, and even managers in Access Israel, the beginning had the feeling that they know best. They know what to do. It's not true. Listen to the person. Enable them to share with you exactly what they need. Look at the person behind the disability. And a very important thing is, even if you have a goal of recruiting a person with disability, don't put the emphasis on the disability. Recruit the qualified person, the most qualified person with disability, but put the emphasis on the qualification. It is doing bad to our goal if you recruit someone just because he, you can check the box and say he's a, with a disability. Look at the person behind the disability. And it all starts at the head. Make a decision at the head of the company that you want to do that, and then let it sink all the way down. That's the way it will work. Congratulations, you made the right decision. You're going to employ a person with disability. I can tell you as I did uh, many times, um, make the decision. And the first thing is communication, communicate with the new employee to understand what is needed for the workplace to be accessible for them. Not every disability needs the same thing as the other disability. And even within a disability, not everybody's needs are the same and then adapt the physical workplace and assistive technologies if needed, again, after you understood the needs of that specific employee. Now, if we plant the seeds of inclusive employment, how can we make sure they really work and they you know, come out to flowers and fruit that we all want them to come out with? First of all, the challenge is to understand that there are different types of disabilities, as I mentioned before. And um, some of them are visible disabilities and some are not. And you need to be very aware uh, of the needs of various disabilities. By the way, in many places, and I can tell you that we are focusing on that also, we don't focus on the disability, but rather the needs and really see uh, how uh, those needs are met. Another important thing, is uh, the stigma. You know, the word crippled in English, handicapped, disabled. I always love the reactions of people when I explain to them where the word handicapped came from. Handicapped is hand and cap. 
because, you know, I'm, I'm, for those visually impaired, I'm putting out my hand like a beggar. Because what else can a person with disability do? For hundreds of years, that was the right terminology. So break that stigma. I'm showing here pictures of people with disabilities, you know, doing uh, scuba diving, uh, water skiing, uh, snow skiing. I can promise you, you will not see me in such positions. I'm very bad at these sports, but people with disabilities can be amazing in it. Stigma, break the stigma. Try to really understand what uh, um, uh, the, 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 the stigma and the fears of your employees are and break them in order to make sure that the, the inclusive employment will work. What are the concerns of, about working with people with disability? This is something you have to understand. Now, another thing that is very important is communication. I will show a very short uh, video and what I will do in order to, uh, for it to be accessible, I will um, uh, describe it as it goes along. Uh, there's no really words being said, just voices of animals. So bear with me. It's as a guide to result-driven communication. In the forest, you see great trees here and three animals, a rabbit, um, um, a, a wolf, and um, I think it's, a, it's a, 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 I don't even remember how you call this uh, animal, but uh, he's going into uh, the uh, cave. Uh, after he understands, the bear has a list of animals he wants to eat. He asks the bear, am I on the list? And the bear says, yes, you are, and eats him up. The following day, the rabbit and the wolf see the um, uh, announcement that the animal was eaten, and the wolf goes into the um, uh, cave. And the wolf asks, bear, is it really true you have a list of animals you want to eat? And the bear says, yes, it is. And the wolf asks, am I on the list? And the bear says, yes, you are, and eats him up. The following day, the rabbit is left alone. He goes into the cave and asks the bear, hey, bear, am I on your list? And the bear says, yes, rabbit. So the rabbit says, can you take me off it? And the bear smiles and says, oh, sure, no problem. And that's it. Precise communication at the right place, the right time is a guarantee for success. Now, when we're talking about communication in the workplace, we have to understand it has to go on several levels. First of all, between managers and employees with disabilities to understand what is needed. I can tell you that in one of the places we um, uh, assisted in inclusive employment, um, they recruited an employee with hearing disability and the manager chewed gum. So whenever the manager spoke with the gum in her mouth, the employee didn't understand what they were saying. All we needed to do is to communicate and to explain the difficulty and give tools on how to solve it. Then we have communication between coworkers and between coworkers with various disabilities. It's very important to understand that when you are employing people with various disabilities, don't assume if you have a disability, you understand all other disabilities. The stigmas are there among people with disabilities also. Everything I said goes for them also. So the starting point, as I said, is the human factor. And in order to speed things up, I will just say um, it's not enough to have regulations and policies. We believe that you need experiential training, opportunities to see the person behind the disability before you start inclusive employment. And then, of course, it's an ongoing process. We say that you don't just walk, don't, don't just talk the talk, but really walk the walk, really enable the employees to understand how it is to be an employee with hearing disability or visual disability or in a wheelchair at the workplace. By that, you will make them understand and be more sensitive to uh, the employees that you are recruiting. Uh, promote conversations regarding stigmas and equality. Don't be afraid to talk about it. There's a big elephant in the room. Make sure you don't ignore it because if you ignore it, it will step over everything. The process will not work and provide tools as an employer for communication and assistance. Uh, by the way, another fine tuning can be if you are employing somebody who is deaf, for example, teach the uh, employees, encourage them to learn basic sign language. Saying good morning in sign language to a deaf employer, employee is something that will make him feel much more wanted and part of the team. Now, some ground rules, and with this, I will uh, try to end uh, this uh, short sharing 
of how we do it right. An employee with disability is an employee, period. No special treatment, no uh, special uh, effects. Um, um, what they do expect is considerations for the needs. A few thumb rules, be sensitive, be tolerant, and be kind. And remember that assistive devices, a wheelchair, crutches, guide dog, are part of the personal space of that employee. Do not touch them. Do not, you know, take them without the permission of that employee. I can tell you that uh, um, I, I gave you an example of a study case of uh, a, a deaf employee. How do we do it? We talk to them facing their way with an uncovered face, speaking clearly, not mimicking overly. Um, if you have to get your, his attention from behind, tap him gently on the shoulder and you can communicate through written channel, channel, channels. Sorry. Uh, and if you have a, a difficulty understanding him, don't just say, oh, he's with a disability. I'll just, you know, make believe I do understand. Ask him to repeat until it's clear. And I will just say again, one thing. We had an incident with a people, a person who is deaf and a person that was very uh, oversensitive to touch. And the deaf person had to use the touching in order to communicate. And because there was no preparation, there was no communication between them, the person with the sensitivity for touch saw it as very intimidating. As I said before, understand and get to know your employees. Try to make sure that you have a uh, right training for all of them with and without disability on how to work together and make it work. I can tell you as an employer, I am the richest employer. The fact that I have such a diverse uh, organization is a win-win-win for us all. That's it for me. And uh, I'd love uh, uh, to share with you um, uh, more experiences, but we have really amazing uh, presentations here uh, uh, to show. So now what I would like to do is um, introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Heather Allen um, from Community Leave, uh, Living Sarnia Lampton. She's an employment coordinator and the presentation she's going to present is Job Path Employment Discovery. Heather, please take it off. Good morning, and thank you for having me here today. It uh, is an exciting privilege to be part um, of this presentation with all of these fabulous speakers from all around the world. Um, it's quite a thrill for us here in, uh, in little small Sarnia, Ontario, Canada. So thank you for having me. And today I'd like to talk about um, our little project called Job Path Employment Discovery. Uh, we are part of Community Living Sarnia Lampton in Canada. And um, I'll take you through a little bit about what we have done here in the last few years through Job Path. Community Living Sarnia Lampton as a whole, um, our, our larger organization began in the early 50s and really as many organizations or groups uh, for people with disabilities, it began with parents and caregivers advocating for family members who wanted more for their uh, families and for people in their community that had a disability as opposed to only institutions. So that's what Community Living has been working on um, since the early 50s. Now our project, Job Path, we began in 2003 and uh, we began with the mission of assisting adults with a disability to gain and most importantly maintain competitive employment in the Sarnia Lampton area. So our goal was not only to find an internship or perhaps a, um, a co-op term, but to find true competitive, sustainable employment for those with a disability. Now, we really found an open door with um, an organization that began called ODIN, which stands for Ontario Disability Employment Network. And one of our founding members here in Community Living helped uh, launch this group and it really opened the door for job path throughout our province. Job path itself is two six week um, segments and our first six weeks are really where we are working with individuals in a group setting and we are working five days a week 
for six weeks. So we have an extensive amount of time with everyone. We get to learn um, about all of their um, abilities, what they like to do, what they don't like to do, what they're good at, maybe what they're not so good at and what they'd like to work on. And we really have broken it down into these key areas, six key areas, which include getting to know you, getting on the path to success, acing the interview, life skills, which I'll touch on a little bit more, health and safety, and then of course, your future job retention. So the big piece about our first six weeks is I would say um, life skills. For many individuals, if they have already worked with an employment agency of some sort, Things like interview practice and resume building are very standard across the board. What's very unique with JobPath is we really focus on each individual and their life skills because we feel there is a true um, piece, puzzle piece that fits together if we have the right life skills so that we can be successful and sustain employment once we get there. Once we are done that first six weeks, we then go into what we call our six weeks of job development. So if you are successful completing the first six weeks and you are ready for employment, then our job developers work with each individual about their particular employment goal and their plan. And we start to talk to our employer partners about what their needs are currently and do we have someone that we truly feel will be the right fit. It's very important during this time that we keep communication open and engaged with all of our participants so that we can ensure they're staying motivated and are ready to succeed. Our uniqueness comes from how we work for six weeks every day with each individual, as I talked about, where we learn their habits and their tendencies. And what we've really found in the last couple of years um, is their mental health cycles. We have found that we have um, a lot more participants coming to us with a mental health um, disability and that has been a, a new um, learning curve for us as far as how we can pull that through the full six weeks of job path and working with employers as well to understand mental health cycles, to understand medications that sometimes go with mental health disabilities and make sure that we're putting someone into a safe and um, successful employment piece. Reliability and abilities, obviously I've talked about, but that permits us to really get to know their employability for the right job. The last thing we want to do here at Job Path is put someone who's not the right fit into the wrong job. They won't be successful, our employer won't be successful. Um, and it really is, uh, it's just not a, a good ideal situation for either side. So that's really the most important thing is the right person for the right job. When we go into employment, we have hands-on coaches. So as long as our employer is open-minded to having a coach come in, our goal is a coach will come in and start with an individual for their first few days of employment, help them get onboarded, ensure that any accessibility items that are needed are being met, help them learn their tasks so that they can then slowly walk away and everyone can be independent at work. We do not have a coach stay on permanently with someone in employment. Again, this, uh, the goal of Job Path is to become successful and sustainable independently in employment. Now, if someone's task changes, our job coach will of course go back in and help that individual learn their new task, and then once again, step away. So that's one area that we are very different compared to many other uh, programs that are in our area. In 2015, Job Path itself received a grant to produce a toolkit, uh, which I have here beside me. This toolkit is something that we were then able to push out across the province. So there's 59 agencies across the province of Ontario that have uh, purchased the Job Path Toolkit, and they now have been able to flourish in their own organizations and are hosting Job Path sessions similar to here in Sarnia, uh, working for six weeks with individuals and getting them job ready. The last year, of course, year and a half, we all found uh, excessive challenges across the globe with the pandemic. 
Now, we tackled this here um, at Job Hub, is we tried to take our curriculum and we put it into a virtual electronic um, platform. So we actually have our toolkit now virtually and we jumped back in last fall with our participants uh, teaching job path in a virtual way. We were able to provide technology and um, give our six weeks of lessons through um, Zoom. That's how we worked with our participants every day. And then we hosted one-on-one -on -one meetings with each individual once a week to really critique and get feedback and uh, have a more personal session with everyone during that time. Just a couple of stats here. Since 2003, JobPath has assisted over 790 individuals with a disability, enhanced their employability, which we have a 76% success rate in connecting people with a disability to the workforce. So on average, as you can see, that's about 44 people per year. And I included this photo here today of Lucas. He's one of our recent JobPath participants Lucas has a, had a, has a learning disability and he did extremely well working with us virtually through Zoom and he is now working at a local golf course and uh, helping them keep their course and their, um, their buildings clean and secure and safe for all of our golfers here when they come out. In this past year with the uncertainty and the crisis of course, um, we knew that we were going to face new challenges, but we're very proud to share that we served 34 individuals since October of 2020 through our virtual format until June of 2021, so over those nine months. And out of these 34, we found employment for 19, and 16 have sustained their employment. Now, I'll touch a little bit on the 16 here. 16 when, of course, uh, at the end of June, one thing that we have learned that I would share as far as our virtual format is it is difficult to always know what everyone's barriers are going to be. And there's certainly going to be challenges that you're not going to see with a participant when you're only online and seeing them in person for a minimal amount of time. So I can honestly say that this is now 14 out of 19 because we did unfortunately have two participants that were not able to keep their employment. Um, it just was not going to be a good fit for them. So um, I did just want to clarify that as we move on. But here's two wonderful, wonderful young men, Cole and Nicola. They are best buddies and they took job paths separately, but both over the last six months. And now both of them are working, you know, almost 30 hours a week and uh, sharing their, their job stories with each other. And they've just really come a long way since October when we first met them. Our project is funded by the Government of Canada. So there are many um, employment agencies throughout Ontario that are funded through Ontario provincial dollars. Ours is funded by the Government of Canada through what's called the Opportunities Fund. And it's a segment of the Employment and Social Development of Canada. And what it does is our mission is to enhance the economic and social well-being of persons with disabilities, their families, and the community. So with this vision in mind, we apply for the Opportunities Fund every three years. And at this point in time, I'm happy to say that we have been able to renew and continue our project every three years. Now, the next uh, project, we will see how that will look. I'm going to assume due to the, the COVID pandemic and still working through that, that we may be working in a hybrid model where we'll be having participants working virtually plus coming to our classroom on a part-time basis. Next for Job Path. Uh, our goal, of course, is to continue with our successful program and having our participants back in person. That's what we're really longing for. However, we are limited to what our guidelines are here in our community and in the building that we are in. So we are hoping to do something in a hybrid model, as I said, um, and we will continue to work virtually with everyone if that is our only option. But we are very excited for the year ahead for more success stories and our participants for their futures 
um, because I think everyone deserves a chance to be part of our employment road to recovery. And for anyone with a disability, they must be given that opportunity to be part of that community. And um, I've included here a photo of Edward. Uh, Edward is working seasonally this summer in uh, the village of Point Edward here outside of Sarnia. And he's loving it. It's what he wanted to do. He wanted to be outside working and working with his hands. So he's really enjoying his opportunity to be part of the community and, uh, and have some independence. And that's everything that I have for you today. I thank you again for having me here today and uh, enjoy. Heather, thank you very much. That was really inspiring. And uh, now all the way from Canada, we're going to move to Australia. And here I'm eager to hear from Isabel Heiner, uh, the Australian Network on Disability. She's the national program manager there. And she will share with us the Australian Network on Disability program. Please, Isabel. Hello, thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Isabel Heiner and I'm the Australian Network on Disability Program Manager. I lead the Stepping Into Internship Program, which I'm so excited to share with you all today. So a little bit about the Australian Network on Disability. We are a business network here based in Australia. Uh, and what we do is we're a national membership organisation supporting businesses to welcome people with disability as both employees and customers. And we support these organisations in our network in a range of different ways. But one of the key ways that we support organisations is actually by running the Stepping Into Internship Program, which was launched back in 2005 to connect university students with disabilities to employers in the open labour market. We've been running the program now for 15 years, and today we see stepping into internships all across Australia in metropolitan and regional locations, um, across both public, private, and not-for-profit sector organisations, and in basically every discipline of study that you can imagine. So anything from law, business, IT, engineering, uh, research, marketing, policy, it's, it's quite diverse. Uh, and we were quite excited last year to have hit the uh, 1,500 internships mark, um, providing practical work experience to university students with disability with over 140 Australian employers. So a little bit more about the Stepping Into Internship Program. Uh, Stepping Into is a demand-led program, which means that it's led entirely by a employer demand. Uh, and we work with organisations here in Australia to really understand what their business needs are. Um, and then we go out to source suitable candidates to match those needs. So we're not a recruitment agency and we're not a charity. We're really here to help organisations meet their, their business goals. I run the Stepping Into program every summer and winter university break. And how it works is we invite businesses to offer paid internships to skilled university students with disability. And it's very much promoted as a strategic way for organisations to tap into strong, diverse talent while building the disability confidence across their staff. All the internship positions are designed to be really well-planned, meaningful work experiences. And the internships run for a minimum of four weeks, usually a bit longer over the summer. And these can be completed either full-time, part-time or flexibly, considering students' needs and, and capability. In terms of how the Stepping Into Internship Program actually runs, uh, A&D here in Australia sources eligible students through the strong relationships that we have with all the Australian universities. So we have developed really strong uh, connections within both the disability services teams and the career services teams at the universities. And they essentially help us source suitable candidates for these opportunities within Australian businesses. Every eligible student is invited to attend a face-to-face, one-on-one screening interview because we understand that some students present better on paper, others present better in person. 
Uh, and back in 2019, this was 958 university students. So it's a, a lengthy part of our process, but it means that we're meeting candidates face to face and getting a really good understanding about um, what their career goals are and their skill sets so that we can put them forward for an opportunity that's going to be the best fit for them. We also provide students with guidance on their rights to request workplace adjustments. Um, many students have not had these types of conversations before. Um, so we uh, provide a lot of value in um, helping them understand how they can actually approach conversations around disability management in a workplace environment in a really um, uh, effective and constructive way. After a &E has interviewed the, the students that apply for the summer or the winter program, we then uh, determine a short list of two or three or four student candidates for each internship available, and we pass these on to the businesses. These organisations will then interview all shortlisted candidates um, and directly employ their preferred candidate. In terms of the support and training that we offer, um, these organisations pay us to run this program. So we actually provide a lot of disability confidence and awareness training um, prior to the internships commencing so that managers have a fair understanding of what disability is and how it impacts uh, students in lots of different ways, helping them understand the scope of that term and how broad disability can actually be. Uh, and we also do weekly check-ins throughout the entirety of the internship program. So checking in regularly with interns and supervisors separately um, to really ensure that they're, they're having the best experience possible. In regard to how stepping into is unique, I've done a lot of research around other uh, internship programs for university students with disability across the globe, uh, and no other program really compares to stepping into. Uh, stepping into is entirely funded by employers, so there's no dependence on government funding or grants. Um, organisations here in Australia pay us about US dollars per intern appointed because they see the value in diversity and they see the opportunity for their staff to actually learn how to be more inclusive and accessible through this process. So the sustainability of the program is, is definite because we're not depending on any particular funds. Employers keep coming back to us wanting to do the program more and more. Another point to how the program is unique is that all interns are actually employed directly by the host organisation, not by A&D, and they're paid a fair work wage, which works out to be about $20, uh, $20, um, 20 US dollars per hour plus superannuation uh, minimum. So a lot of the interns actually get paid a little bit more than that as well. Um, but it means that these individuals are contributing to our economy um, and paying taxes and, and um, a part of the, the overall Australian workforce. We also really uh, pride the program on the fact that the, position the positions are identified by the employer needs. So there's no roles being created for a person with disability. These are all already opportunities that are identified as gaps within the organisation or opportunities for project work or support work within a team. Um, so there's meaningful work provided to each individual in turn. We also have fantastic commitment and support from the universities across Australia. So we have about 40 uh, big universities here in Australia, and we have de developed really fantastic relationships with each and every one of them. Um, and they help us uh, source suitable candidates and promote these opportunities out to their students um, because they see the value in their students coming through this, this particular type of work experience that is supportive and, and helping them build their skill sets um, to be employable when they graduate. Uh, and also it's a mutual benefit for all parties involved. So for students, it's a great way for them to, to get that foot in the door and build their professional um, work exposure. For managers, it's a chance for them to upskill and really better understand what disability is and feel more confident to welcome someone with disability into their team. Uh, and for organisations, they're putting themselves out there as an employer of choice of people with disability on the Australian market, um, but also contributing to the culture and development of an inclusive organisation in general. And finally, the thing that we're most proud about the Stepping Into program is the large scale of this, this program. As I said, we've had 1,500 students come through this program. Um, last year, we had over 1,000 students apply for the program. Uh, and in 2019, we saw over 200 internships progress. 
So this large scale means large impact um, for students with disability and also for the Australian workforce. I won't go through all the specifics of the, the outcomes and the impacts that we've noted, but we, we have really great stats on the outcomes for, for our interns. So 34% of our interns in 2019 were actually offered contract extensions or ongoing work or places in that host organisation's graduate program. Uh, and a study that we did in 2018 showed that four months after graduating, 80% of stepping into alumni were in employment related to their studies compared to just the general 58% of alumni um, of graduates with disability, sorry, that didn't come through the Stepping Into program. So there's a clear definite advantage to students coming through this particular program. 99% of our alumni said they would recommend the program to others. In regard to the employer impact, uh, back in 2018, we found that 87% of managers agreed uh, that they were more confident about managing or supporting a team member with disability after completing the program. Um, and 93% said they would be happy to be a referee for it for their intern. Uh, we were really proud of Telstra, one of our um, uh, leading Australian telecommunications companies here in Australia. They use the Stepping Into program specifically as a strategic pipeline into their graduate program. And over four years, they hosted over 100 interns and they actually use this to surpass their 10% target of grads with disability coming through their graduate program, um, meeting over 11% of grads actually identifying as having, having disability, and most of them actually came through the Stepping Into Internship Program channel. In regard to the, the future of Stepping Into, we have big plans for, for what Stepping Into can offer. We have huge interest from Australian organisations. More and more keep coming and knocking on our door wanting to get involved in this program. So growth is certainly the focus. We want to provide more opportunities for students with disability to gain this practical, real-world, paid work experience before they graduate university. Uh, and of course, on the flip side of that, we also want to continue developing awareness of the skills and talents of people with disability across the Australian workforce. Uh, demand from employers is certainly increasing. We now have 320 of Australia's leading employers in our network. Um, the goal is to, to meet 500 by 2025, and we are well on track to meet that goal. Um, my team's strategy has a, a goal to, to hit 300 internships by next year and see this increasing at an 8% increase each year after that. We also really want to explore new ways to actually share this program with eligible students across Australia. Um, we know that there's more than 1,000 students with disability in Australia, so a big goal of ours is actually understanding how we can promote this opportunity to every single individual in Australia that's eligible for the opportunity. And finally, we want to share our learnings and successes with other NGOs and business networks across the world. Um, stepping into has proven to be an incredibly uh, uh, successful model for a stepping into program and entirely self-sustainable. Um, so we're keen to share this opportunity in any organisations that are keen to, to hear a little bit more about how we do this. Very happy to have that conversation. Thank you so much for your time today. Isabel, thank you very much. Great program, great impact, uh, and truly something uh, worth sharing. Um, and now from Australia, we are um, moving to our next and last uh, speaker. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Marie DeWitt from Pathways Program. Uh, she's the coordinator there uh, in Trinity Center for People with Intellectual Disabilities. And with her, Stefan Ryan, a graduate of this project. So please, go ahead. Thank you so much for inviting myself and our graduate Stephen Ryan here to speak with you today. Um, we're going to tell you a little bit about the Trinity Centre for People with Intellectual Disabilities and in particular about our graduate internship program that um, we are running in association with EY. So I just wanted to give you a bit of a background about the, the centre to start with. 
So we are based within the School of Education, which is in Trinity College in Dublin, in Ireland, beautiful Ireland. Um, we run a two year certificate program for students with intellectual disabilities. The course is a full time course and it covers a wide range of subjects. And the idea behind this is to give our students a very broad education, um, which will then uh, allow them to build on that after college. So our ultimate goal is to promote um, inclusion. So that is inclusion in education and also then wider uh, inclusion in society. And what's important to us and to our team and to our graduates is we always focus on the ability of our, uh, of our students. We always um, focus on their skills and help them to develop and build upon the areas that they have an interest in to achieve their goals. So our graduate internship programme is three or six month paid internships with our business partners. The important thing is that these are real and meaningful roles that add value to the team and add value to the company. So we are, we are, we are lucky that we have an occupational therapy team within the TCPID and we work very closely together to plan and prepare well in advance of each internship and to try and match the individual person to the role that is best suited to their skills and to their abilities. And that's really, really important to us. Um, so we try and develop key employment skills. And what, what is key to everything working very well is that the, the graduates are supported by mentors within each of the businesses. And these are people who volunteer to become mentors and to support the young people in um, settling into the company and in, in getting used to the world of work. And they are absolutely central to the success of the programme. So our um, graduate internship uh, programme in EY has been hugely successful. And uh, we have had five of our graduates who have been offered permanent contracts since we first started with the first internship in 2017. So each of these graduates are completely different, completely different skills, completely different personalities. And the thing that that is so uh, wonderful about this is that they have been matched into a role that suits their particular skills. So the inclusive policies that were developed over the years with EY are now fully embedded within the HR team and are, are part of the HR uh, policies within EY. So now, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our graduate, um, Stephen Ryan. And what we're going to do now is we're going to have a, a conversation to, uh, for Stephen to tell you about his story so far in EY. So Stephen, thank you so much for joining me for this presentation today. Um, maybe we could start, if you could just give um, everybody uh, uh, an introduction to yourself and, and tell them about why you decided to come to study uh, in Trinity College with us. Yes, of course. And um, thanks for inviting me to the Zero Project. Um, and my name is Stephen Ryan and I'm 28 years old. I come from uh, County, County Leash in Ireland. And um, I'm also a member of Special Olympics. And Stephen, so where did you hear about the course in Trinity College and, and what were you doing beforehand uh, before you joined us? Well, my mum and I was desperately trying to find something for me to occupy my time because before I joined in Trinity, um, I was on my own for two years without an education, without a job and um, pretty much without a future. So. Like, it was a very low point in my life. But my aunt, who works in Trinity College Dublin, came across this great course for intellectual disabilities. And um, I had to apply. We weren't looking for much. We were just looking for something. And I could never um, anticipate that what would happen. Fantastic. And uh, do you remember, because I remember your interview day, Stephen, what happened to you on the way? Yeah, like I got the train to Dublin and my train broke down and I was an hour and a half late for the interview. Uh, that didn't dampen my spirits, but I thought I would just, I thought I lost my spot. So um, I continued like the interview never happened. And then the next day I got word that I got accepted to the course. 
and it was the day I would never forget. And I think we were so impressed with your resilience and your determination that even with the train breaking down, you 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 succeeded. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your experience in Trinity? Well, my experience in Trinity, it's really um, changed my confidence. Like before I wouldn't, before I joined Trinity, I would be terrified to go to Dublin. But now I go to Dublin regularly enough and I absolutely love it. And I go to places I've never been before. And it's all because of Trinity that gave me this confidence to excel in life. Brilliant, Stephen. And then if we move on to um, your work placement and then your graduate internship in EY, if you could maybe uh, talk a little bit about, about how all that came about. Yeah, like um, there's 22 subjects on the course and it's a wide variety of courses over the two years. And at the end of the two second year, um, you did the work experience module. And this, I, I was happy and privileged to have my work experience in EY, Ernest and Young in um, Dublin, Harcourt Street. And the team there couldn't have been more supportive. I was given a brilliant mentor, Neve Parsons, to help me excel not just in work, but in society. That's fantastic, Stephen. And so then you um, you were invited back to do an internship, is that right? Yeah, I was invited back to um, do an internship in EY um, at the end of my um, work spans. And I was very happy and privileged to be invited back. And can you tell us, I know you mentioned your mentor, Neve, but can you tell us how the team in AY supported you from the beginning and made you feel included? Yeah, the whole, like it wasn't just my mentor, Neve, it was the whole team that supported me in EY. Like um, they treat me as a person first and they treat me as, um, and they never mention anything about disability or never treat me because differently because I have a disability. They treat me as a person first, which I think, it's fabulous, but many people with many organizations out there wouldn't treat you as a person. They'll treat you differently because you have a discipline. And that's so important, isn't it, Stephen, that, that you know, that, that it's people first, really, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Treat, and... uh, treat you as your ability first and who you are. Like, they shouldn't treat you differently just because you have a discipline. Exactly. And then can you tell us what happened um, on your birthday uh, there a few years ago and after your internship? After my internship, the 19th of August 2019, I got offered a permanent contract in EY, which I would never forget. And it, it just like even my colleagues were messing around saying that they were bringing notebooks in saying, oh, where's your notebook? Are you taking notes? And um, stuff. And I wouldn't have imagined what would have happened. Like, um, my legs were like jelly when I got them um, told I made permanent. <laughs> That's fantastic, Stephen. And it was, it was, you know, it's important to say that you were made permanent after only two months into an internship, which is just so impressive and a real credit to the work you had done. And and just Stephen, if I could maybe ask you to talk a, a, a little brief moment just about the type of work that you do in EY um, and, yeah. and how complex that is. Yeah, like there's a, like, like it's important to say that I do stuff that contribute to the team. Mm -hmm. I don't do stuff just um, like they don't just find something for me to do and I do. I do something to contribute to the team. So what I do is kind of like run daily reports that helps the department. And I'm also in charge of the client list. So I'm in charge of all of the like levers and joiners. I have to add them to the list. That's fantastic, Stephen. And, you know, can I just ask you then, how do you think that you have changed in the past few years since you started your studies in Trinity College and then moved into working in EY? How have you changed? It's um, kind of surreal how much I changed because um, I wouldn't have been as confident. Uh, my confidence has just soared since I started in Trinity and my confidence has just soared even more since I started in EY. And now I have like kind of friends, colleagues, which I which actually invite me to social events and give me a social kind of work life too, which I think is brilliant. But um, my my life has just totally changed since I started in Trinity. 
That is brilliant. That is brilliant. And there definitely is a social life. I know that in EY that you're very included in. Um, and can you tell us what are your goals for the future? Well, my goals for the future is kind of simple. Um, I have no, um, um, like, I, I just want to work hard in EY and try to climb up the ladder and be an executive someday or even um, uh, next level up and try to get more responsibility with EY. Fantastic. And then a final word from you. What would you say to any company that might be considering hiring somebody with an intellectual disability? I would say go for it because um, you don't overthink it. Just um, go for it because at the end of the day, a person with a disability is just a person. You have to accept them for who they are and, and treat them as a person first. And they're just like any other person. They just want to be accepted. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you, everyone, for um, for allowing us to to tell you about our program and uh, and to kind of, you know, get it out there to a wider audience. So thank you for having us here today. Thank you so much. And this was really um you know, good information to take and, you know, start making a change back home. Um, I'm very happy now to have all the panel together. And I wanted to introduce a question. But before I do that, I want to share with you one small thing. I joined my first Zero project eight years ago. I came with awe, looking and listening to everybody that spoke from, you know, all over the world. Uh, it seemed to me like, such amazing projects and who am I? How can I really uh, contribute? How can I really get to where they are at? So many times when we hear these amazing, inspiring projects, um, we have to remember that in the audience, we have people who are maybe at a different stage than we are now. We probably can relate to them because every project starts from a difficult beginning or from a problem that we have to solve. So. I want this question to be addressed to those people. I want us, you know, to, to be frank and share with our audience, not just the good, but share with us maybe one challenge or one um, situation in the project that did not go well. And how did you cope with it? It's important for us to understand that even, you know, projects have ups and downs. As long as the direction is up, we're on the right track. So... I'd love for uh, Heather, can you uh, begin and maybe share with us something that maybe didn't go so well, but you overcame it? Yes, certainly. Well, and I think this past year has um, given us all challenges to overcome. Certainly we can all agree on that. I would have to say in the most recent time with having to do our project virtually due to COVID, we had an unfortunate situation with a young man who um, we were, or we thought we had been successful through our job path with our six weeks, and he seemed very motivated to get to work. But unfortunately, due to other outlying instances going on in his family life um, that were providing some outside challenges, we were just not able to help him sustain his employment. Now, for us to overcome, which we um, have found in the past works the best, is we utilize not only our own team, and I can't emphasize that enough to have a team of people. Um, you might not, they might not all be staff, but to make sure that you have a team of supportive people that you can bounce ideas off of and brainstorm together. Um, so our team itself came together and our other community resources came together to make sure that we were not just shutting the door for this young man, we were providing other open doors for him so that he now is going to be able to continue his journey and hopefully our goal is that we'll be able to come back with him uh, once he's able to get some other life situations sorted out he certainly has great potential um, we just needed to put him in a path with some other resources before we can continue on employment for him great thank you so so you're saying basically open-minded you know, uh, uh, brainstorming, you're know, having a team uh, for support, for brainstorming for those corners you, you, you find yourself in and you're trying to find ways to come out. 
And if yes. you can't go into, into the door, go through the window, find other alternatives, don't give up. That's right. That's there's a where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> Perfect. Very good. Uh, Isabel, please. What about you? Tell us, share with us, you know, what went wrong and how did you cope with it? Thank you, Mikkel. Uh, Isabel here. Yeah, no, we um, uh, have been running the Stepping Into Internship program for 15 years now. So um, we've got most of the, the niggly bits down pat, but an ongoing challenge that I'd say I regularly see as part of the program is um, helping the, the people leaders or the supervisors that come through the Stepping Into Internships um, shift their focus away from focusing on disability specifics and shift the focus towards workplace adjustments um, and helping them understand the importance of actually understanding the practical things that an individual might need in a workplace environment, um, whether that be flexibility in their work schedule or a change in the way instructions are communicated or a change in the work, workplace environment or a piece of equipment. These practical things are the are the. Um, uh, important pieces of information for them to really be focusing on um, and reminding them that knowing someone's disability um, or, or understanding what someone's diagnosis is actually isn't going to help them be a better manager for that particular individual. Um, so while they might be curious about the disability specifics of their intern, um, we remind them regularly that um, they shouldn't ask about someone's disability specifics because often that can be quite personal or, or sensitive information. And at the end of the day, um, it's more important for them to be focusing on what the practical things they need to put in place um, are in order for that individual to perform to their highest capacity in a workplace environment. Um, I think that's probably the, the regular conversations that I'm having with managers. And once they understand the importance of um, adjustments over disability specifics, um, then they're just focusing on, you know, how can I be a great manager to all of my employees? So it becomes more ingrained in them being uh, uh, wonderful managers for, for everyone um, and not necessarily needing to know whether someone has disability or not, because as we know, about one in five Australians have disability. Um, so it's probably likely that um, by creating environments that are already accessible and, and inclusive and welcoming, um, they're probably supporting more people than they'd even realise. Perfect. So I, I think it's, it's, it's totally in line with the experience that I shared of preparing the grounds, you know, really uh, uh, trying to, to make uh, uh, the employees, uh, the, the, the managers to really understand the rules, understand the, the, you know, the rules of the game. How do we do it in a way that is respectable and uh, communicate it uh, everywhere? Thank you very much. Uh, important point. Um, and um, uh, last, I would like to uh, ask the same question from uh, Marie. Marie, please, what was your experience, your bad experience that you overcame? Thank you for the question. Um, I'm happy to say that we haven't really had any negative experiences as such with the program but we are learning all the time so when we started the internship program in 2017 we we were learning from every experience from every graduate and from every business so it is constantly evolving and what we have found is hugely important is to build each relationship very carefully so every company is unique every graduate is unique so therefore, we have to adapt the policies and the procedures for each um, for each situation. So we do learn from everything good and bad. Um, we evolve and we have developed further training for the businesses. We have streamlined the processes as much as we can. So our graduates are very much involved in developing uh, new formats and, and helping each other to settle in to the company. So for example, in EY, there are now five um, graduates working there. So Stephen and our other graduates help the newest arrivals to settle in. So they are very central to everything. But again, you know, we don't see anything as negative because everything is a learning experience for us. And it helps us to make the program better and to evolve it. Um, what we did find this year was because of the COVID pandemic, we had to upskill all our graduates in computer skills. 
because all of our internships moved completely online, um, which was a big, big challenge for us, for the companies and for everyone involved. But we have learned so much from what would be a negative experience. Um, and we've, we've allowed our graduates to be able to have the skills to work remotely and to present remotely like Stephen is doing today. Um, he does that every week for EY already. So everything we do helps us to get better. And we will never say we're perfect, but we're working towards being the best that we can possibly be for our graduates and giving them the best opportunities that we can. Thank you very much. Um, great answer. Um, amazing. So, you know, to close this session, I will just say that, um, you know, doesn't matter whether you are uh, like I was at the beginning of Zero Project, sitting here in awe at the beginning of your, uh, um, you know, your involvement in the field of people with disabilities, inclusive employment, hearing all these amazing presentations and wanting to learn more how to do it in your place, or whether you have an amazing project you think, you know, can change the world or can change at least the place you're at. This is a great platform and a great way to share because eventually we all can become much better when we share information, when we learn from each other. And, uh, you know, as we said, the COVID is an amazing uh, uh, lemon. Uh, you know, we see it all over the world. But I think that what we saw here is that we have great lemonade makers uh, that really took out the good uh, and really learned and adjusted their programs in a way that can be uh, dealt with even in such uh, difficult times. And I think this is what it's all about. So inclusive employment is something that we need to do together. Learn from each other. I'm sure that each and every one of the speakers will be more than happy uh, to continue sharing. Contact us if you want and share your great experience. Thank you very much. And thank you for Zero Project in general and Zero Project Latin America for giving us this opportunity of sharing. Have a great day.